Adherence to traditional religion is in decline. Something new is taking its place, and I'm deeply concerned about what the results might be. I will love my black neighbors the same as my white ones. You may lose God from your society, and as a non-believer I have very mixed views about that. But just because you've lost God from your society doesn't mean you don't have God-shaped holes. A massive God-shaped hole in our society is what the hell people are meant to be doing with their time here on Earth. The woke answer it with a pretty good answer of their own, which is that life can be most meaningfully lived by fighting for justice. The never-ending fight for justice has become a new political religion that is based largely around the concept of intersectionality. Intersectionality is the idea that people can have more than one overlapping marginalized identity characteristic. Whoever has the most marginalized characteristics is the most oppressed and has the best access to truth. As a result of prizing subjective experience over objective truth, it is nearly impossible to have productive conversations on important issues, and many otherwise intelligent people have started to believe and act in ways that they otherwise would not. It's not just that it's just spontaneously or arbitrarily pops up. There is a system in place that manufactures these ideas. They look at the universities as their own particular ideology mill, and they indoctrinate people into intersectionality. These are people who are teaching very dangerous ideas. What makes those ideas dangerous is that they're divisive. We start looking at each other in terms of race. This does not advance civil rights causes. It's exactly the opposite. One of the reasons this has taken such sway is because it's a kernel of truth to all of it. As a result of the tragic killing of George Floyd and others, books like White Fragility and How to Be an Anti-Racist have once again become bestsellers as people try to make sense of race in America and figure out what they can do to help. The problem is that these books are acting as poorly written religious tracts that convey concepts like all white people are racist and literally everything in life revolves around race. Masses of people are being indoctrinated into a new religion without even realizing it. It probably doesn't feel like indoctrination. Many people may just think that we are finally waking up to injustice. The truth, however, is much more dismal. The iconic texts of the woke religion are intentionally divisive, and the end goal is not equality. Objectivity, reason, and even science itself are considered to be white, male, Western constructs, rather than simply being the best tools we have to understand reality. This kind of thinking is being pushed on people of all ages. We now even hear of children being told that if their parents or grandparents do not agree with the views that they have been given, uh, then they should distance themselves or condemn their parents and grandparents. And I think, by the way, that this is revealing of nothing so much as a cult. Any movement that says that people you love who do not entirely agree with the point of view that you are told to believe, that you should distance yourself from those people, that's a cult. It's a cult. One key aspect of successful indoctrination is not being aware that it's occurring. It took me a while to realize it, but I know what it's like to be indoctrinated and to have my view of reality drastically altered by religion. I grew up in a small conservative town where nearly every aspect of my life was controlled. I was brought up in a fundamentalist sect of Christianity and was sheltered from much of the outside world. Any secular influence had the potential to lead me into sin, so it had to be kept away. Similarly, the woke are creating an environment in which speech and actions need to be controlled or silenced. Anything that doesn't conform to this puritanical worldview is simply wrong. There are goals to be reached, and the ends certainly justify the means. Workplaces and schools are being segregated for special diversity trainings, desperately needed police units are being defunded, and people are taught that their skin color is something to obsess over rather than ignore. But this is all done in the name of justice, and it's seen as virtuous. Why do you think people are so hoodwinked by this? Because it's an answer to a number of very big questions. It says in a quasi-religious manner, in fact, it's better than religion, isn't it? Because religion says if you sort these things out, then in a life to come, you will find um, salvation. And the social justice activists and the intersectionists and the much more say, if you do all of these things, we can get justice here on Earth. So one of the reasons I think people are so hoodwinked, I think they're hoodwinked by language. Mm. I think they're hoodwinked by these words. 
Equity sounds really good. Mm. Inclusion sounds really good. Diversity sounds really good. Safe space sounds really good. All of these words mm. sound good. And most people, they don't really know what they mean. I mean, just think, anti-racism. Mm. Yeah, who's not on board with yeah. that? If you don't know the moral underpinnings of that or Black Lives Matter, mm. well, of course Black Lives Matter. Mm. Mm. Yeah, once people agree on the reprehensible nature of racism, homophobia, bigotry, misogyny. Once they agree on that, then of course they want to be on the side of the right. people opposed to all of that. The problem is then you jump onto the side of all the people who are opposed to all that and you discover they can do things as wicked as anyone else. Right. The woke social justice movement has managed to institutionalize a new set of beliefs and even their own language in virtually every aspect of our society. Many people latch onto these beliefs because they find a community of others doing the same. One of the more positive aspects of growing up in a Christian home was having a sense of belonging and community. Not only that, but my Christian faith gave me a purpose, a grand narrative that inspired and motivated me. Having a sense of purpose and meaning allows us to endure the hardships and tragedies we face in life. Given the decline of traditional religion, there needs to be something else that gives people a narrative and provides purpose and meaning. Fighting for so-called justice and equality is what provides that for huge swaths of people today. Many of these people believe they are on the front lines of a new civil rights movement, even though most of those battles have already been won, and it has never been better in America than the present day. When you say never been better, some people think you mean, oh, absolutely everything's sorted out, is it? I don't say that, but I say it's very obvious, provable, by any fair estimation, that the situation in America today on every rights issue is nothing like the situation it was in in the 1950s and 60s. We've come a long way very fast and people should be very proud of it. But there are people, as I say, who believe that they need to keep struggling. They find meaning in the struggle. They find a purpose in the struggle. And for that struggle to really be engaged in, they need to pretend that our society is institutionally racist, institutionally homophobic, institutionally sexist, misogynistic, patriarchal, and that therefore we have to fight as previous generations did. The fact that women have long been shut out of dangerous industrial jobs is part of patriarchy. Rape culture is not a myth! Rape culture is not a myth! In my late teen years, my faith and entire worldview was starting to collapse. I couldn't help but question the morality of the Bible, and I started to doubt whether God was really full of love if he would be willing to send someone to eternal damnation for simply lacking a belief. My struggle with severe depression peaked at 20 years old, which is when I fully lost my faith. I had nothing left to guide me and nowhere to turn. Without a sense of meaning or any reason to go on, I wanted nothing more than to end my own life. My faith was my entire identity, and I lost it all. There were many things that helped me through that time, including my relationship with my sister, therapy, and medication. But having the opportunity to rebuild my identity, create my own sense of meaning, and finding a community were the crucial and sustainable ways that I overcame my depression. Many people, when they lose faith and find no system to completely replace it with, replace faith uh, with a form of nihilism. My own belief is that we have an awful lot of flares along our path to guide us. And that is everything that we have and have inherited, which give us an idea of what we might do with our lives. And that's one of the reasons why the total nihilism of the movement that's going on at the moment is so revealing. If you regard the uh, past, all your predecessors, all of everyone else's predecessors, as merely reprehensible, morally imperfect people who didn't have precisely the views we have in 2020, then no wonder that you're staggering around a beleaguered wasteland wondering what the hell you should do with your life, because you haven't listened to anyone, because you're so presumptuous that you think that all of the obvious answers would have been dropped on you like rain. And I have very little sympathy. I have sympathy, but not much tolerance, you might say, for people who say, I don't know what I'm doing here, and have simultaneously snuffed out every single flare along the path that might have guided them. We need to know our history and how we got to where we are in order to not repeat the mistakes of the past. 
we already have the tools we need to build meaningful lives. There are certainly injustices out there that are worth fighting for, but this doesn't mean we should blindly accept a new religious calling, especially when it does not encourage forgiveness and redemption, comes with beliefs that are anti-scientific, discourages open inquiry, and has already led to so much harm. What we need is a vision of unity, compassion, and forgiveness. Those of us who are concerned about racism, sexism, and any other form of bigotry need to push back against this discordant and reckless ideology because it achieves the opposite of what it claims. I was involved with Palestinian Solidarity for seven years after the death of Rachel Corey in the Gaza Strip in 2003. Her parents formed the Rachel Corey Foundation for Peace and Justice in her memory. A goal of the foundation was cultural exchange. And to that end, in 2010, it was decided to produce a mural in downtown Olympia in collaboration with artists in Palestine. The project found itself enveloped in drama when the Corey Foundation was accused of racism. Their crimes, tokenization, microaggressions, and cultural appropriation. After endless hours of painful internal meetings, a community forum was held. It was filmed for the public. We were berated by our accusers for our skin color, our privilege, and our ability to be ignorant of the pain we caused them. Any response other than listening was seen as further proof of our racism. We took it seriously. The project was completed, but many people left the foundation and the movement. I get phone calls now, um, and they play up the diversity. Oh, we're looking for a diverse set. You know, we want to make sure that we have equal representation on the crew. Okay, fine, I don't care about that. Call me because you think I'm a good DP. Call me because you like the way that I shoot, you like my approach to the job. Essentially, what they're telling me is that they don't consider me to be on the same level of professionalism or ability as Joe Smith. And I, I feel I've been robbed of something as a result. It's hard not to take it personally. So the retreat, the first day of the retreat came and there were two hired professional facilitators who presumably have authority in this area. They were from a local consultancy firm. We went around the room and the facilitators asked us to tell us about your race in the context of your childhood, your adolescence, and your college years. And it got to me and I said, I'm uncomfortable talking about this stuff at work, so I'm going to pass. So everything seemed like fine after that, but then a few hours later, one of the facilitators said, I want to be clear, any white person who expresses discomfort or distress or any kind of resistance toward talking about their race when asked to is not actually experiencing discomfort. So don't feel like you can you, you should comfort them because it's not discomfort. It's called white fragility and it's a power play. This was a public humiliation because I'm white and because I expressed an authentic feeling. This was framed as a manipulative maneuver on my part. It was an act of aggression 